Hi everyone, Andy here at Maltech again with another suspension video. Um, today we're going to talk about valving. There's a lot of misconceptions in the industry about valving. You think that you change uh, from one rider to another rider that, or a different application that this shock needs valve. Well, yes it probably does need valve, but that's the very last step in the whole process of setting up a correct shock. Um, valving, we're going to show you how it is the last step in the process. So hang tight, we're going to, I got something here on the board behind me written down, you may be able to see it right now, um, but we're going to go through each step and what needs done in valving, how we do it. Alright, we had a request to make a video. Um, they wanted us to show valving charts, really I think, and, and to explain valving charts, but we need to go over this first in my opinion and I need to show you the importance of the order and why we do it in this order. So here is our chart of how we set up a bike correctly. And someone calls me up and asks me, hey can you valve my shocks? My first question is why do you think they need revalve? A uh, user are going to say, well, I bought this for a different application, they need valve. Well, this is the order that needs to be done. And we need to start with the correct linkage first. If you don't start with the correct linkage that has the correct progression rate, well, we don't want a progression rate that is too great. So, let's say... We take, for instance, a starting leverage ratio of 3 to 1, and let's put our ending leverage ratio over here, which is a 2 to 1. Let's just call this 400EX slash 450R. This is too great. We want not near as progressive of a leverage ratio. So let's just put 2.5 to 1. And what this is is just a leverage change on the shock. And that's what your linkage actually does. That's the whole benefit of running a linkage. So we want a smoother transition. What happens if you get too progressive? the bike's going to kick, you're not going to bottom the shock out. That's what's going to happen. Yeah, it's going to be soft to begin with, but then it's going to bottom easily, or not bottom at all. All right, so correct progression rate. Progression is key. So if we aren't starting with the right linkage, we can't go on to the next step. Um, correct extended and compressed links. I have another video on this. Um, that explains how we change these lengths. We also have another video that tells you where to measure these lengths at. Uh, pretty simple, pretty straightforward. If you don't start with those, we can't go on in the next step. So that sets your correct up and down travel of the rear wheels and front wheels. Doesn't matter, front or rear, we're still working on the same lengths. Um, correct spring rate. So, we also explained this in another video. Uh, spring rate is directly related in the in the rear is sag. So that's how we know if you have the correct spring rate. You check sag, we know what it should be per application. It's different for every application. In the front, we want you to measure that main spring height so the height of that main spring <coughs> we can uh, we have a program that we built and we can have you measure the main spring height we know what you what we want it to be we can input what yours currently is how much it compresses and it'll output what we what the spring rate should be now all of this comes back to one thing and it's leverage. That's what suspension works off of is leverage. 
Say you have a heavier rider. Okay, your levers didn't change from one rider to the next rider, but you have more weight pushing on that shock. So it's how much weight is pushing on the shock, which correlates back to leverage. Um, and leverage, I mean, let's say we have a shock and it's pivoting at the frame. So this is the frame and we have an A-arm and we have here's your spindle and wheel and tire out here this is your A-arm mount well let's say we have a shock on here this wheel has leverage on this shock so the farther we move this in the higher the leverage is going to be it's just like you're trying to pry something with a short bar or you're trying to pry it with a long bar so in correlation the farther you move this in the higher the leverage ratio is the higher this spring rate has to be for the same weight rider valving is directly related to one thing and that's spring rate but spring rate is correlated back to to leverage so leverage is going to be our big factor and we don't know what that leverage is till you tell us what spring rate we're going to need so the very last thing in the whole process is valving and that's why someone calls us up we can't just valve a shock we got to know if it's right first i can valve it for that spring but it's not going to be right um, if the spring isn't right. Now let's go over what valving actually is. And this is what our dyno valving is. So I'm going to draw out a chart of what our dyno outputs. And we've got a few quadrants here. And on this here is our middle this side is our compression this side is our rebound and as the shock compresses it's gonna start moving this line outward and it's gonna come down and it has to slow down to start its rebound stroke so it's gonna slow down then it's gonna start speeding back up on rebound and then it's going to slow down and then go back to compression. So we have our speeding up quadrant and compression, slowing down quadrant and compression, speeding up quadrant and rebound, and slowing back down and rebound. And all of our dyno is read in inches per second, so how fast it is running. Um, the slower you run it, the farther down this line is going to be, of course. So we run always at a couple set speeds. Sometimes we'll go to a third speed if we want to see a higher, um, actually we'll go to a higher inches per second. But what this is is a force graph. So how fast or how much pressure it takes, and it's actually pounds, is what our force. So how many pounds of pressure it takes to move it that fast. Um, and of course everything goes back to leverage ratio so valving the heavier your valving is the heavier your sorry the heavier your spring rate is the heavier your valving is going to be now I've got a few examples here I'm going to show too but let's go ahead and erase some of these lines maybe this will make it easier to see The way valving works is the more shims you add in or the um, thicker shims you add in. Now it's always the case I can remove shims off the bottom of the stack and that's going to make our valving stiffer also. And that's internally inside the shock is what I'm talking about. And all you're doing is speeding up and slowing down fluid flow which in essence speeds up and slows down your shock, how fast it moves. So that's all valving is. Um, what we'd like to see is a smooth line. We don't want any 
sharp lines on our graph. So that is one point of valving we need to look at and that's all on piston design. And what your piston is is just a circular metal disc and it has holes in it and with a shim that sets on top of those holes and the shim will actually the shim is flat but it will actually flex and it will let oil bypass it and there's also going to be a rebound hole in the center of your shaft where oil can bypass your piston before it starts blowing past this is where the oil blows past your valving shim so we're just speeding up and slowing down oil flow and it all goes back to your main spring rate which goes back to leverage ratio as we explained before now I'm gonna go on and show you some actual graphs I just pulled some out of my dyno sheets and we're just gonna kinda go over what they are uh, help kinda explain what is going on in the dyno sheet what we look at and how we valve and you know there's other uses for the dyno also that we've used here we have a just off the wall I just grabbed a chart all of these charts that I'm going to show you for different applications nothing special about them um, but you can see here what just one of our normal graphs looks like uh, you can see our compression and we've got two lines on each side one is going to be our high speed and one's going to be our low speed so the low speed and you notice the slower we run the dyno the farther in it's going to be regardless if it's it's valve stiff or, or valve light um, but our low speed you can see it's pretty well a straight line it's really not trying to even lift those shims off yet it's just going past our bleed hole and it's really hard someone says oh I can change your low speed or I can just change your high speed well no it doesn't happen that way it's all in piston design and if you change low speed you're gonna change the high speed or if you change high speed you're gonna change low speed you're those shims don't have a brain and all they know is how much oil they're gonna let by or not so um, you can see what we want is a nice nose on this and that way it gets us a good smooth transition it doesn't wear you out that's something you're not gonna be able to feel but you are gonna be able to your body's gonna feel it it's not something very noticeable at all now you see this bump out and you're gonna see it on another chart here the next one I have our dyno only has three inches of travel so if we have a shock that has more than three inches of travel then this is gonna hit the bottom out bumper and you have to really pay attention to we don't want to run a shock with like a two inch shaft travel or else it's really gonna bump it up it's gonna move the springs on our dyno um, here's the next chart this is a rear 450R, I can tell you that. Um, we valved this for TT. You can see it took 300 pounds at, at what we ran for high speed. 300 pounds of pressure to move this line out to here. And it's about 50 pounds to get it out to here, about 60 pounds. You can see this shock had a lot less stroke because it really hit the bottom out bumper. That's another test you can do on this dyno. You can actually see what it takes, how much force it takes to move your bottom out bumper too. Um, if you notice, we've got a little bit of play here. It's actually play in our dyno. We've got a bearing that needs tightened up. No big deal. Doesn't affect anything else. We're just used to seeing that. Here's a good example of we were valving a shock. So we've got marks on here, and that's what we were really shooting for. We'd like to hit those numbers for our high speed and our low speed. And you can see, we probably started here on this green, is our valving to begin with. So we, when we get a shock in, we're going to throw it on the dyno. We're going to see what it looks like. We're going to see what spring rate we recommended. Then we're going to valve off what that spring rate is. So you can see we've gone in here and we've changed it, and it looks to me like we probably... 
um, dynoed this shock three times, so we probably changed it twice before we got where we were happy with what the, the reading was on the dyno and sent the shock out the door. And then what we do is we record this, uh, what shock it is, um, what application it's for, and what spring rate is for in the customer's name. Um, this shock probably was an important one, it's just one I threw in to the uh, pile of shock dynos that I have. Now, this one here, we've had a lot of comments on this. This is the PEP, the old dreaded PEPs that a lot of people still run, think they're great. They're actually oversprung and undervalved. Um, you can see how drastic this check ball piston is and how violent it hits. And actually you lose, the faster you run it, you really don't gain hardly any more in valving. Um, it blows that next check ball off and you can see it hits twice there on two different check balls. Now this is something you can't feel on the bike, but you can throw this on our hand dyno and you can actually feel it. Our next dyno is a PEP shock. You can see in the purple. And we've got it listed here, and we use this for reference for showing people that come in. Um, this is the check ball piston, the purple, so you can see how violent it is. This is some another customer, totally different, looks just about the same. So what we did, we actually put in a different piston in this shock, and it smoothed this graph out. I hope you can make that out. But then we changed, and we went to a... A different uh, weight oil on this also now something you guys can do you can you can pause the video and you can kind of look at this and and see and you can see also how far out this graph went on the rebound side um, but it gives you good indication of how good this this orange color line works and it looks like uh, we changed the uh, oil for this in the green is what we did and you can still see it's following that same line it jumps up there also so that still had that same piston in there but it did lower um, change our rebound side because it's just a there's no check ball on the rebound side on those pistons it's just an open hole for rebound now another thing I mentioned we can do testing on and we did looks like a uh, seal drag test um, on a Fox Evo shock. So we actually put this in with no um, air pressure in any of the chambers and we just ran this slow and saw how much seal drag there was and you can see how much it took to uh, initially start that shock moving also. So it took a, a lot of stiction force on this shock in order to get that to start moving. So I hope you guys find this interesting. Got any comments um, or questions, just post them down below in the comments. You can email us, andy at maltechatv.com. You can send us a text, give us a call at 217-491-2000.